Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Sempervivi, and this is going to be a very special episode of the show. We will be taking a look at the Mid-Atlantic television program that was taped on Wednesday, August 11th, 1982, at WPCQ Studios, Channel 36 in Charlotte, North Carolina, and began airing in local markets beginning the weekend of Saturday, August 14th, 1982. And, as a bonus... We'll also hear what took place on that weekend's Worldwide Wrestling, which was taped following Mid-Atlantic on the same day. And later, since this show will be debuting on Thanksgiving Day, I'll be sharing some of your thoughts on which Starcade of the Jim Crockett Promotions era carried the most meaning and memories. But before we begin, if you like the podcast and want a little bit more of it on social media, just search at Mid-Atlantic Pod. We update everything when we can, with most of the focus going to our Twitter page. Now, as I've mentioned several times over the last few shows, this particular episode of Mid-Atlantic is not available on the WWE Network. It's very newsworthy, so is it strategic by WWE, or is the tape outright missing? We're not quite sure, we just know it's not there. But because of our friends over at the Mid-Atlantic Gateway, we are going to be able to fill you in on this really newsworthy and important weekend in the territory. Back in the mid-80s, I wondered if I was like the only kid who sat next to his television with one of those chunky black portable tape recorders. You know the kind if you're of a certain age. The one that had the little orange record button inside the play button, and you had to press down on both of them to begin recording. And then like along the way, you learn to hit pause instead of stop. Because if he had paused and said a stop, uh, that way you wouldn't clip off anything uh, on either side of what you were recording. And plus, it made you kind of like more on the ready. So when a commercial would end and the show would come back on and you were trying to get theme music or you were trying to get an interview or something like that, like you were ready to go. Thought I was the only one. But as the years have gone on, I have found out I am far from the only one who did such things. and. Sadly for me, I only have one audio tape left still in my collection from a few days in 1987, but thankfully, David Chappell was far more careful and organized than I. David has kept some of his recordings from over the years, and through Dick Bourne, his tag team partner over at the Mid-Atlantic Gateway, he has allowed us to share a little of it with you. How lucky are we (laughs) that one of those tapes happens to be from August 14th, 1982? I will tell you, we're very lucky. Through 30 numbered episodes of this program and several specials, we've had the chance to speak about a lot of Mid-Atlantic Championship wrestling cities. There are Charlotte, uh, Greensboro, of course, expansion area locales that are close to my heart like Baltimore and D.C., We've spoken about satellite territories in Toronto and in Knoxville, associations with Tulsa, Atlanta, Tampa, but we really haven't spoken about the Commonwealth of Virginia, where there are so many legendary cities and venues and cards. To the east, there's Norfolk, down on the Tidewater, where pro wrestling on Thanksgiving can trace its lineage as far back as 1958, when local Jim Crockett promoter Bill Lewis presented a main event featuring George Becker, Mike Clancy, and Ray the Crippler Stevens, defeating Carol Fozoff, Mike Padusis, and Tom Bradley. In the West, the Blue Ridge Mountains, local promoter Pete Apostolou Sports Club, worked with Crockett to run towns like Lynchburg, Danville, and of course Roanoke, the Starland Arena on Shenandoah Avenue, where they ran until 1975 when the shows graduated to the Civic Center. And then there's the state capital of Richmond. Since the turn of the 1900s, professional wrestling had been held in the city. But a whole new era debuted on September 7th, 1934. Less than a month after running his first card nearly 300 miles southwest in Charlotte, Jim Crockett, alongside the aforementioned Bill Lewis, presented his first show in Richmond, at least the one we have on record. It featured future world champion Everett Marshall defeating Emil Dusick in a two-out-of-three falls match. And just like that, the promotion was now running two states. I mentioned his name, and acting as the local promoter, Bill Lewis was as old school as you can get. A Rocky Mountain, North Carolina native, he was trained to wrestle by Farmer Burns on the carnival circuit in the early 1920s, taking on the name of Captain Bluebeard. His wrestling career was subpar, 
but his hustle game was top-notch, as Lewis would work his way into becoming the promoter of record in Greensboro by 1927. When Lewis passed away in 1961, Raleigh-based promoter Joe Mernick assumed his cities, further cementing the Crockett and Mernick Promotions wing of JCP as the strongest local effort. Mernick promoted as far out as Charleston, West Virginia, and now controlled all of eastern Virginia from Charlottesville to the Seven Cities, in addition to the eastern half of North Carolina. And just a note, other than Lewis, Mernick, and Apostolo, other Crockett local promoters included Henry Marcus, who controlled everything in South Carolina east of Columbus, including Charleston, and Paul Winkhouse, who essentially controlled everything west of Columbia, including Spartanburg, Greenville, and Asheville, North Carolina. Before I go off on too much of a geographical tangent, I'll give you some idea about the market of Richmond. And I'd like to read to you a portion of a column written by David Chappell in the year 2000 as part of his ongoing Richmond Reflection series for the Mid-Atlantic Gateway website. Chappell wrote, During the Mid-Atlantic years, our night for wrestling was every Friday night. Friday night was probably the best possible day of the week to have a car regularly running in your city. Through early 1974, wrestling in Richmond was at the State Fairgrounds at Strawberry Hill on Friday nights. Then in the spring of 1974, Mid-Atlantic Wrestling was put on regularly at Parker Field, an outdoor baseball stadium that housed the Atlanta Braves AAA farm team, the Richmond Braves. The Richmond Arena and the Richmond Coliseum also held events. The Richmond Arena was a rundown city-owned facility that was dark and dingy. There were posts and beams everywhere, thus making it difficult to get an unobstructed view of the ring at all times. And did it ever get hot in the summertime at the arena? The arena held approximately 4,500 people for wrestling. Jim Crockett Promotions held cards at the arena for about three years until the middle of 1977, plus several cards in 1981 when the Coliseum was undergoing renovations. The arena typically had lesser cards than the Coliseum, getting the Friday nights when the Coliseum wasn't booked, but world champions came to the arena and titles occasionally changed hands there. The Richmond Coliseum was Richmond's largest venue, having a capacity of nearly 11,000 during the Mid-Atlantic years. Many historical matches and moments occurred at the Coliseum, and arguably this building was second only to the Greensboro Coliseum in its housing of great Mid-Atlantic cards. The Richmond Coliseum never held more than two cards per month, making the events that did come there that much more special. Folks in the outlying areas around Richmond also got to see wrestling on Friday nights when neither the Coliseum nor the arena were booked. Essentially, these cards were in smaller towns that the local affiliate, WTVR-TV Channel 6, could promote and reach with its signal. I'll mention a few of these towns as they were many. To the east of Richmond were Tappahannock and Saluda. To the south of Richmond were Colonial Heights and Petersburg. To the west of Richmond were Charlottesville and Harrisonburg. To the north of Richmond were Fredericksburg and Stafford, the latter two coming perilously close to the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area and the WWWF. And that was David Chappell. You can find that column in its entirety over at the Mid-Atlantic Gateway. And the difference between Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia was about 100 miles. So there was a, a clear divide. And when that TV station, WTVR Channel 6, signed on the air in 1948, it actually became the first television station in the South, the first one to sign on south of Washington, D.C. And no surprise, pro wrestling would become a staple. Before too long, Jim Crockett Promotions was using their Saturday afternoon show to wind up Richmond fans for the upcoming show on the following Friday. And WTVR is where David watched the show and became a lifelong Mid-Atlantic Championship wrestling fan. He grew up in Ashland, 20 miles north of the city, and he never strayed too far, even matriculating at Randolph-Macon. Finally, he left the state in 1984. Although there's no truth to the rumor that Angelo Mosca Jr.'s title reign was the traumatic event that caused his exit. But, without any other further ado, let's get to this show that David recorded way back when off his TV, August 14th, 1982. It's not on the network, but boy is some stuff going on. The world champion Ric Flair is back in the area, and he's clearly not looking for the fan support. A week before, in Greensboro on Saturday night, Flair was wrestling Wahoo McDaniel in a 2 out of 3 falls match for the title. Flair got himself disqualified during the third fall. He went on a rampage. He attacked McDaniel with the ringside barrier stanchion, busted him open. And Flair's actions, both getting disqualified during a title match and his violence against Wahoo, did not sit well with local promoter Jim Crockett Jr., 
who happened to be serving his term as president of the NWA. And in storyline, Crockett would attempt to use his leverage as NWA president to try and force the board into granting Wahoo a rematch, an encounter that Flair was refusing to acknowledge. Here's Bob Cottle introducing the show and welcoming on the NWA president. Hi, wrestling fans. Welcome to Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. An exciting hour this week. You're going to see plenty of action with four great tag team matches, also a singles match. And in that singles match, we'll see featured the U.S. heavyweight champion, Sergeant Slaughter. Team together as tag teams. You'll see set stars as Jay Youngblood and Rick Steamboat together. Leroy Brown and Ivan Koloff. What a team they are together in a tag team. Jack Briscoe will go with Jimmy Valiant. And this is an interesting tag team match. Gene Anderson and Paul Jones together in one corner. And speaking of interesting things, right here with us now, NWA President Jim Crockett, who has a message for all you wrestling fans. Thank Jim. You, thank you, Bob. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I uh, wanted to come today to tell the, the fans that I resigned recently as president of the National Wrestling Alliance. Due to the actions of Ric Flair and the board of directors, total lack of concern for the wrestling fans and the welfare of the wrestlers in the ring. On August the 7th, uh, Wahoo McDaniel wrestled uh, Ric Flair in Greensboro, North Carolina. Had the match won, in my opinion. Uh, Ric Flair uh, then went totally berserk, tried to put uh, Wahoo out of wrestling, he picked up a ring stanchion mm. and busted his head open badly. I went to the board and requested they fine or suspend uh, Ric Flair for his actions. They refused. Then Ric Flair notified the board that he would never wrestle Wahoo McDaniel again. And I asked the board to uh, order him to wrestle Wahoo, and they did not. Uh, Ric Flair earns his living from the wrestling fans. Right. And I think he is cheating the fans, and I think the board is cheating the fans by not ordering this, and so I have resigned. Jim, I tell you, I'm stunned by that. All right, uh, fans, there you had the words right from the mouth of Jim Crockett, who is now the former NWA president. And here with us, Jack Briscoe. Jack, that's a stunner for me, really. Well, it certainly is a surprise, and, you know, I believe that Jim Crockett is uh, very justified in what he has done. As he said, the world champion shouldn't be able to dictate to the promoters or to the people around who he's going to wrestle and who he's not going to wrestle. You know, that's the very reason why they have NWA standings and uh, uh, number one challenge list and so forth, and Wahoo certainly is. So uh, I can't say if, uh, you know, if the world's champion go around dictating to the mm-hmm. president of what he can do and what he won't do. And I don't blame Mr. Crockett at all for resigning. But an uh, interesting situation that's confronted me is uh, I've been getting messages that Roddy Piper is putting out feeders wanting me or Jimmy Valiant to join him as a partner since... Rick Flair also turned on Roddy Piper in a recent tag match with Wahoo McDaniels and myself. So Piper is now very upset with Rick Flair and has asked me and Jimmy Bryant to join him in his efforts to try to do something about it. So uh, uh, in long consideration of it, I've, I've accepted it, although, you know, I won't believe it uh-huh. until I see it. But uh, for right now, I'm going to go along with it. And Jack, I, I know. i I got to see that, too. I yes, mean, that, that's something that's hard to take. Well, the boogeyman and I talked about it at great length, and we thought, you know, if a man is really disinterested to put out feeders and come actually come up and ask us to join him, then uh, we'll give him that opportunity, but we're going to keep an eye on him. Well, now, you got that mid-Atlantic belt. That mid-Atlantic belt meant an awful lot to Roddy Piper. Well, this is what Piper and I had all the trouble over. Yeah. I know how tough Roddy Piper is. He knows how tough I am and how tough boogeyman is. And he has asked us to join him. So, uh, like I said, Boogeyman and I discussed it. Uh, we're going to keep our eyes on him, but uh, we're going to we're going to join him. See what we can do about that's it. That's something I'm looking forward to seeing Thank and you, to see what happens. And fans, I know you are too, with Jack Briscoe and Jimmy Valiant and Roddy Piper sort of together. We'll be back here. We've got great tag team action coming up in just a moment. Jay Youngblood and Rick Steamboat together. Right after we take this time. And there we hear from the former. NWA president Jim Crockett Jr., who has resigned, could not force the NWA into taking disciplinary action against Ric Flair, mandating that he gives Wahoo McDaniel a return match. Ric Flair saying he will never face off against Wahoo McDaniel again. Wahoo's going to have to do something here now, isn't he? He's going to have to figure out a way to get himself back into the mix. As of now, he is on the outside looking in. Ric Flair, very cocky, and here's the reality of the situation. Jim Crockett, his two-year term as president of the NWA, well, that was coming to an end. And at the end of the month, all of the promoters of the NWA from across the country 
would get in planes and fly to San Juan, Puerto Rico, where the annual NWA convention was held, and Bob Geigel, who was the president for the previous two years before Jim Crockett assumed the position, would then become the NWA president for the next several years after that. So fortuitous timing there as Jim Crockett Jr. has resigned his position supposedly because of Ric Flair's actions. In reality, he is stepping down from that position because, well, that's how that position went. (laughs) And Bob Geigel gave him a lot of purpose considering his territory was not lighting the world on fire at the time. So there is just a whole lot of stuff going on in there. What we have not discussed yet, but you heard Jack Briscoe discuss, Roddy Piper taking a face turn. We saw Roddy Piper last week on Mid-Atlantic TV, a day after he was stabbed in the chest by a fan, losing the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship to Jack Briscoe in Raleigh, North Carolina, nearly losing his life, made TV the next day, shot down Sir Oliver Humperdick's attempt to bring him into the house of Humperdinck. Roddy Piper is his own man, but it looks like he's looking for friends. And Jack Briscoe, you heard him, revealed that Roddy Piper is asking to be partners with him and with Jimmy Valiant. And uh, can you believe it? After the $10,000, after everything that's been done, Jack Briscoe, being the fine, upstanding person that he is, says he is open to it. If Piper came to him like a man, I think that's a little bit crazy, but then again, I don't have Jack Briscoe's skill set. And as Briscoe noted, we'll be keeping an eye on Roddy Piper. So a hell of a way to start the show, a hell of a way to start August. August of 1982 is a hot time in Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. There is going to be a lot of familiar high-end faces that are going to be coming into the territory. And obviously, we got a big shakeup at the top. We've got Roddy Piper. As a good guy, we're going to find out about an old good guy going heel during this show and his motivations and such, but we'll keep it moving right now, and we'll take it to the first match that we have some audio of. From the House of Humperdinck, Bad Bad Leroy Brown teaming up with former television champion Ivan Koloff to face off against Tim Horner and Mike Davis. Sir Oliver Humperdinck joined Bob Cottle at the desk, hyped up his men, and noted the training of Gene Anderson, who he's brought into the fold. Never have I seen such a transformation in a man in my life. Bob, tell me when is the last time you saw a tag team combination like this? Look at Koloff and look at Leroy Brown. They're working for me. They're under the banner of the House of Humperdinck, which is expanding ever more every day. And I, hey, listen now, as good as they look now, you're going to find this hard to believe, but I got them in the gymnasium every day, Bob, and they're working out with a guy called Gene Anderson. When you want to know about tag team wrestling, you go to a guy like Gene Anderson. What a just combination. about wrote the book on it. That's right. Just about wrote the book is right. He got Tim, Tim Horner right now. He kid doesn't even know where he is. He doesn't know if he's in a TV station or at the airport. Koloff's got him well in hand, baby. Like I was saying before, Gene Anderson is the dean of tag team wrestling. He knows everything there is to know. Look at that! All right, Horner right here. They pin it. Count of two. Koloff kicked out. Again, he was caught by surprise by the young man. Here's Mike Davis. No, I tell you, I think if I were uh, a tag team wrestler, I would just about as soon look across the ring at a couple of wild bears as to look across and see Leroy Brown and Ivan Koloff. I had started to mention earlier that since Leroy Brown became a member of the House of Upper Dink, it looks like he derives pleasure out of punishing somebody, just like he did right there with David. He looks like he got a pleasure out of that. He knows what gives me pleasure, and that's winning matches, and he'll do anything that he can to give me pleasure. And I'll do anything that I can to ensure that he's a wealthy man. I'm going to make him rich. I'm going to make him famous. I can't make him any better looking. I think he's pretty good looking right now. Ooh, powerful. Oh, right hand. Davis with a tag. Here's Horner. All right, Horner now with a foot in. Ooh. That front face and Koloff has really got the pressure to it now. He's got that big old forearm just right across that jawbone. And when he gets bone rubbing against bone, brother, right. Horner came up with a wrist. Koloff now there slams him to the mat again. There we hear from the House of Humperdinck's new team, Leroy Brown, Ivan Koloff. We do not have a finish for that match, but I can report to you, they did defeat Tim Horner and Mike Davis. 
in the next match. Jack Briscoe and Jake Roberts defeated Ken Timms and Juan Reynosa. And then it was time for Wahoo McDaniel to join Bob Cottle. He talks a little bit about Jim Crockett Jr. and talks a little bit about Ric Flair's attitude. Wahoo McDaniel has, has had a lot on his plate here recently. Sergeant Slaughter was lurking in the shadows. Crockett came out and said he was resigning that presidency because of what happened to you and, and with Ric Flair. Well, I hate for him to, you know, to take you know, that part, and I hate to see a man and uh, his statue resign from the presidency, but the man did put 20 stitches in my eye. I'm not screaming about that because I've had it before. But when a man deliberately tries to cripple you, then you've got to have some kind of control. You have to find a man or you have to suspend him. And now he's telling the NWA who he's going to wrestle and who he isn't. Well, somebody has to have control. And, they, you know, you, the champion has to listen to the NWA president. And uh, evidently, Flair's not going to do it. And the board wouldn't make a decision. So Jimmy uh, resigned, in which I can't blame him. All right. Now, Flair says, in essence, that he's not going to wrestle you anymore. Is that right? Well, he says he's not. I just don't see how he can dictate to the NWA that who he's going to wrestle and who he isn't going to wrestle. He said he's never going to wrestle me again in a title match anywhere. So, you know, I just don't see how he can dodge the number one contender in the territory in this area uh, when he comes in here. I don't either. Well, and, uh, I, don't see, I don't see how the fans, uh, uh, the fan pressure. I mean, he's going to have to, wouldn't you think? Well, I think the fans, uh, I think the fans will eventually pressure him into having to wrestle me. Uh, if he wants to be one of the greatest NWA champions they've ever had, which that's his goal to be one of the best and keep the belt the longest, then, uh, you know, and... Uh, I'm up here listening to you talk. You want to take on Flair? You want his belt? You want my belt? Well, there it is! All right, Sergeant Slaughter fans, right out here. Here come the two privates, Private Canodal and Private Nelson, and they, they hold Wahoo, and it's Slaughter who has got that headpiece and just tearing it all to pieces and slamming it all in Wahoo as the privates hold him and slaughter now. Just, and here comes Jay Youngblood. Here comes Jack Briscoe and Rick Steamboat. And very, very quickly now, the privates and Sergeant Slaughter take off. Wahoo, who was really taking a tremendous beating from all three of them while they were holding it. Tore that headdress up. Huh? Yeah. in the face with that belt. Mm. He hit you with a he hit Wahoo right in the face with the with that U.S. Heavyweight Championship belt. An absolutely wild segment. Sergeant Slaughter attacks Wahoo McDaniel, who was talking about Ric Flair, focused on that, focused on Jim Crockett Jr. standing up for him by stepping down as president of the NWA, talking about how Ric Flair is trying to avoid him. And meanwhile, as all of this is going on, as we know from the last couple of weeks, as we know from all of the house show results, Sergeant Slaughter and Wahoo McDaniel, their feud has been raging. Sergeant Slaughter has been complaining about the fact that he has been getting beaten up by Wahoo McDaniel. He's been taking brutal beatings, but he has been holding on to his United States Heavyweight Championship. He and the privates go out there. They attack Wahoo McDaniel. He drills McDaniel with the belt in the eye that was injured by Ric Flair. Wahoo busted open again. Wahoo's headdress got taken. The privates begin to tear that up. Wahoo McDaniel left laying there. Briscoe, Youngblood, and the Steamboat make the save. Just an absolutely wild time. Something that would have been lost to history if David Chappell had not recorded it really draws everything together here because ultimately in a couple of weeks, Wahoo McDaniel would be facing off against Sergeant Slaughter in a hair versus title match. And without this information from this show, we would never actually have the complete history on what took place. Hopefully the video of this could be found as well too. Before we keep it moving, I'm not sure where it took place in the broadcast, but since the privates were out there helping Sergeant Slaughter attack Wahoo McDaniel, I will note that Private Carnoodle defeated Leroy Dargan. So that took place. Private Nelson and Jim Dalton would be a team. They would face off against Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood. That may have been around the time during the episode when they attacked Wahoo when Carnoodle knocked off Dargan. So I did want to note that as we continue to move on here. Now, there's a lot of the next match on the tape, and I'm not going to play all of that for you, 
But what I am going to do is to play the introduction as well as play the promo afterwards. You see, all of this talk about Roddy Piper becoming a good guy, suddenly and unexpectedly, number one, Paul Jones, has joined the House of Humberdink. Why? Well, he'll let his motivations be known. Here's Bob Cottle announcing what is taking place. Out, and this has got to be most interesting right here. Here is Gene Anderson in against Abe Jacobs. Outside of the ring, Anderson's partner, Paul Jones, believe it or not. And across the ring, outside for Abe Jacobs and his partner, is Keith Larson. Of course, Abe Jacobs has been against Gene Anderson a number of times, but never with Anderson having as his partner, Paul Jones. And another thing... That is most interesting at this point, and befuddling also is the fact that Humperdinck is right out there with Paul Jones. And it looks to me at this point, as Anderson makes a tag, here's Paul Jones. It looks to me at this point as if the house of Humperdinck is continuing to grow, and by leaps and bounds. All right, fans, Easy right here, time, Sir baby. Oliver Humperdinck. I got to ask you about this. I know all the wrestling fans are wondering, what in the world could have happened to Paul Jones? Never mind Paul Jones for right, right now. What in the world happened to Roddy Piper? Every time I try to call Piper, he doesn't return my calls. He says he doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't want to talk about joining the House of Humperdinck. And now he's hanging around with guys like Briscoe and Jake the Snake Roberts and these guys. Well, let me tell you something, Roddy Piper. I don't need you. You understand what I'm saying? I was going to make you a star. I was going to make you everything you wanted in the world, brother. But I don't need you. I've got another guy right here. My good friend now, Mr. Paul Jones, who's a gentleman from the board one, brother. Roddy Piper, I don't need you. I got Jones. And just to show everybody I'm a man of my word, brother, you just peruse that. And if it's to your like, you will ink it right here on television. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what. I don't have to read this because I am no dummy. My mother did not raise a fool. Listen, I know where I want to go, and I know what it's going to take for me to get there, and it's going to take Mr. Humperdinck. I've always had respect for him, and I'll never stop having respect because you're a man that makes champions, and I want to be a champion, and I am going to be a champion. And let me tell you something else, Wahoo, and all the rest of you. I hate your guts. If you ever want to look at a real man, look at him, look at me, look at Brown, look at Kolov. From now on, you're all going to pay. And I guarantee you one thing right now. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of not having a belt around my waist. And this man right here is going to see that I get more than one around my waist. I don't care about the money. I know the money goes along with it, but I'm motivated by titles. Thank you. you. I want us to finally shake the hand of a real man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I see great things in his future. Let's get on now to a couple of guys I really can't stand. And I'm talking about Jack Briscoe and the thief, Jimmy Boogie Woogie Man Valiant. Well, it seems that Roddy Piper has now associated himself with guys like Jimmy Valiant and guys like Jack Briscoe. Well, let me tell you something, boys. You're messing with the House of Humperdinck. You're messing with Koloff. You're messing with Bad Bad Leroy Brown and a lot of other guys that are working with me. So Briscoe, Piper, and I'm talking right at you, Roddy Piper. I don't need you. Briscoe, Piper, Valiant, anytime, any place, anywhere, it doesn't matter to us. We're going to be there, and if you have any guts at all, you'll show up. I've been talking about the thief. Tell you know, I've always had respect for this Roddy Piper because of his wrestling ability. He didn't care what he had to do out there. He went out and he did it. Now, I don't know whether it's all this money flowing around this area that has influenced this Roddy Piper to go to this boogie woogie man, to go to his assistant, to go to his aide, and this Jack Frisco world champion, now he's sticking his toes in it. I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to find out just what this team is made of when I team up with Leroy Brown and Gene Anderson. I know that I got team partners that's going to stick behind Koloff and take them apart. And don't you worry, man. I'm going to get my TV belt back. I don't care what they have to do to do it. I don't care what I'm doing. You know, he's talking the truth. It doesn't matter anytime, anywhere. There's one hot Indian running around because he got his feathers tore off. Well, Bob Slatter, hooray for you, brother, and hooray for the House of Humperdinck. 
It's all going to be mine before it's over. Fans, we'll see you next week. And until then, so long. And that's how that edition of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling came to an end. The entire house of Humperdinck out there, Sands the Ninja and Matt Bourne, both of who uh, have become afterthoughts here with the front line of Ivan Koloff, Leroy Brown, and Gene Anderson. Koloff still in feud with Jimmy Valiant. Leroy Brown and Ricky Steamboat obviously going at each other. Humperdinck very insulted by Rowdy Roddy Piper, doesn't need him anymore. Why? Because now he's got number one Paul Jones. So with Piper having to be moved over quickly to the good guy side, somebody needed to flip heel. Ric Flair is going to be coming in, but of course he is the touring NWA champion. So anytime he is in the territory, it is going to be relatively temporary. There are going to be some big-name bad guys that are going to be coming in by the end of the month. But for right now, Paul Jones joins the House of Humperdinck. Why? Because he wants championships. Like a lot of athletes, sure, he's got money, but he just wants to win one more time. He wants that glory. He wants that shine. He wants to be number one, Paul Jones. Yeah, that's that's my best Paul Jones impression right there. But uh, yeah, so that was Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. As I mentioned earlier on, Ricky Steamboat and Jay Youngblood also wrestled. They defeated Private Nelson and Jim Dalton. Kernoodle defeated Leroy Dargan. We talked about that. And you heard a little bit of some of the other matches on the show. So that wraps up Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. And as, of course, many of you know, Once the Mid-Atlantic tapings wrapped up, then it was time to tape Worldwide Wrestling. And guess what? David Chappell also has that. So not only are we going to hear what happens on Worldwide Wrestling, but we're also going to be hearing about some events that may be coming to your area. And since this was WTVR-TV in Richmond, Virginia, we're going to be hearing about a show coming up August 27th, Richmond Coliseum, The Friday nights that David had written about, you're going to hear promos for those shows, both from the good guys and from the heel side as well, too. So that is going to be coming up right now. But since we haven't played it, I don't believe, before, here's the worldwide wrestling theme. Wrestling fans, Rich Landrum here, along with my co-host Johnny Weaver. And John, you know, we talked about a new decade in wrestling. That music, also courtesy of the Mid-Atlantic Gateway, that was the worldwide wrestling theme used between 1978 and 1985. Rich Landrum is not our host today. Our host today, David Crockett, alongside Johnny Weaver, and the ramifications and the reverberations of Jim Crockett Jr. stepping down as president of the NWA has taken precedence also on this program. And much like Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, after the guys get done speaking about it, they throw it to the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion, Jack Briscoe, to get his comments. So I will not play Jim Crockett's uh, speech in its entirety, but we will play the wraparounds to that, the opening with David and Johnny, and then the comments from Jack Briscoe and Wahoo McDaniel. Worldwide Wrestling, and John, it's, it's, it's a program that uh, you're all going to remember because we have something very important to tell them. It certainly does. We have a lot of news and that's uh, concerning uh, big things that's happened in the past week or so and also concerns the president of the National Wrestling Alliance. And we have a little speech by the uh, president of the National Wrestling Alliance, Jim Crockett. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to uh, talk to you. Let him talk to you, the president of National Wrestling Alliance, Jim Crockett. Let's show him right now. We have with us, David, a former world heavyweight champion, Jack Briscoe. Jack, what are your views on this? Well, I feel very uh, sorry to see uh, your brother, Jimmy, quit or resign as president, but I certainly do understand the reasons behind it. After all, as he said, Ric Flair does earn his living off the wrestling fans, and when he starts dictating to the NWA what he will do and what he won't do, and when the president goes to the board and can't get them to do anything about it, then there's nothing else left. 
I feel that Ric Flair was very wrong in what he did, taking a piece of metal and almost knocking the Wahoo's eye out. So I believe that uh, Jim Crockett has all the right in the world and is, is certainly justified to be resigning because I think uh, Ric Flair certainly has got out of line and uh, if he hadn't have done so, he would have certainly lost the belt and wouldn't be world champion today. All right, thank you very much, Jack. Now, Jack, uh, Jack is here, and now we have a man that was involved in that, uh, Wahoo McDaniels. Wahoo? Well, you know, I was involved in it, and I was very, I felt bad about Jimmy resigning, and I felt bad about getting hurt, and I felt bad about not winning the belt. It just hadn't really been my week, and, you know, we got another thing that happened to me, and uh, it just seems like things are snowballing bad for me right now, but I know things are going to turn around, and there's a thing I'd like to show you what just recently happened to me, if it's possible. All right, Wahoo, yeah. let's show it to him right now. I'm up here listening to you talk. You want to take on Flair? You want his belt? You want my belt? Well, there it is. All right, Sergeant Slaughter fans, right out here. Here come the two privates, Private Canodal and Private Nelson, and they they hold Wahoo. And it's Slaughter who has got that headpiece and just tearing it all to pieces and slamming it all in Wahoo as the privates hold him and Slaughter. Now. All right, Wahoo, we all saw it. Well, you know, it's, I can stand here and cry over spilt milk. But I never cried over spilt milk. I sure I'm embarrassed about my feathers. And, you know, I hear a lot of people, they holler, they say, yeah, 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 slaughter, slaughter. But when you look them in the eye, they can't look you in the eye. Well, I, I'm tough enough, and I can, a man enough, man can tear my feathers up. I'm I sure it embarrasses me. Sure it hurts my feelings. He went out there and tore somebody's car up and run over it, tore the door off. I'm sure you'd cry. Because you've got to replace it. It's something that means something to you. But I'm going to tell you something, Slaughter. There's no way that I'm afraid of you. Flair, there's no way I'm afraid of you. I've beaten you all more times than you've ever beaten me. So I'm going to tell you, 20 stitches in my eye, I'll heal. I'll get me some more feathers. Because I'll guarantee you one thing. Slaughter, I've got you in lumberjack matches somewhere, I know. You can't get out of that ring. You'll have to suffer. Flair... You can no way dictate to the National Wrestling Alliance, and you'll have to wrestle me someday, and you can bring all your fans. I don't care. But deep down in your heart, you know probably I'm the only man in the world right now that can beat you, and I'll do it. All right. Thank you, Wahoo McDaniel. All right. We have one upset in him there. We have an exciting show. We're going to be back with Jack Briscoe in action right after this. Right. Be right back. There we hear from a very angry Wahoo McDaniel alongside Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion Jack Briscoe. He and Sergeant Slaughter, Wahoo that is, have been taking their lumberjack matches all over the place. Violent brawls over the United States Heavyweight Championship. Sergeant Slaughter still is holding on to it as of right now. The war continuing on between Sergeant Slaughter and Wahoo McDaniel, who's getting it on all fronts. He's got to deal with Ric Flair. Jim Crockett Jr. has resigned as president of the NWA. All of this craziness is taking place. So it's got to make you excited if it was coming to your town, right? Usually when we do the show, we are talking about things that took place, promos that had taken place in lieu of the local promos. We've gotten lucky a couple of times, but for the most part, Unfortunately, on these master tapes that are up on the network, for the most part, it's just practice promos that were recorded at the same time that they were recording the show. But guess what? We have promos for the show coming up at the Coliseum on August 27th. I'm going to go ahead and let Big Bill Ward tell you all about it and how it usually worked with these promos. The bad guys got their say early in the broadcast, and when it aired later on, that's when you got the good guys. Fans don't miss a big card of wrestling at the Harrisonburg High School Gym on Thursday, August 19th. Ninja, Bad Bad Leroy Brown, the Charlie Mahomet Inc., Ivan Koloff, Jay Youngblood, Ricky Steamboat, Jimmy the Boogie Woogie Man Valiant, and many others. Super sensational card at the Richmond Coliseum coming on Friday, August 27th. Private Nelson and Private Canodal, a team to take on Pork Shop Cash and King Parsons. Ninja meets Jay Youngblood. Six-man tag team action. Gene Anderson, Paul Jones, Bad Bad Leroy Brown. With Sir Oliver Humperdinck against Jack Briscoe, Wahoo Daniel, and Ronnie Piper. There's been a lot of things going along in the Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling area lately. One of them is my latest acquisition, Paul Jones. Paul Jones now is working for me. And Ronnie Piper had the audacity to turn his back 
I'm the greatest manager in wrestling today. Well, let me tell you something, Roddy Piper. I need you like I need a third foot. I don't need you. But I'm going to tell you one thing, Roddy Piper. Richmond Coliseum, brother. Six-man tag. Gene Anderson, a man who's well-versed in tag team wrestling on my side. Paul Jones on my team. And, of course, the man from Chicago, Bad Bad Leroy Brown on my team. Let's look at the opposition. We've got Jack Briscoe, Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion, Hungry Jack Briscoe, Wahoo McDaniels, and the turncoat Ronnie Piper. Well, let me tell you something, Piper. You're going to find out exactly what it's like when you embarrass me in public. I'm going to show you in Richmond exactly what happens to guys like you. Now, let's get on to Russian chains. Let's get on to Ivan Koloff. Let's get on to Jimmy Valiant, the thief who stole his title. Well, we've got you right where we want you now, boogie-woogie man. A Russian chain match. You're going to be on one end. The bear's going to be on the other end. And the first man to go around dragging the other man to touch all four corners is the one who wins the match. Tell him about it, Bear. I'm going to be the man, Bo boogie-woogie man, American. I'm going to be the man that wins this match, that drags you around the, the ring and touches all corners to gain victory, to get my TV belt back. But before I do this, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to pay you back for embarrassing Kolov. It called off over the head to steal my belt. Enrichment is going to be over for you. Gotta love those localized promos. Absolutely love them. When I was growing up, Tony Schiavone was the one who did most of them. Man, I love those localized promos. And there was the House of Humperding talking about everything that's going to be going on with them. Uh, I don't know if you heard this a little bit earlier on uh, during the introduction when Jack Briscoe was, was getting into the ring for uh, a, a match. He was uh, said to have one for the night, and he does. He faces off against Matt Bourne, and he got the victory there. And that takes us to this match, which was joined in progress. It was Paul Jones against Tim Horner. And uh, I'm not going to play the whole thing for you, but it sounded like it was a very competitive match. And... Uh, you know, somebody that really loves radio and who could fall asleep uh, with, with wrestling on in the background. You know, I, I love actually having the audio of wrestling, even though some people it just drives them nuts. It's such a, a visual affair for them. But for me, hey, wrestling touches all senses and all of the feels. So I'm going to go ahead and play about the last two and a half minutes here of this match between number one Paul Jones and Tim Horner. And it's truly the last stand here for Paul Jones, who is turn dirty, and join the House of Humperdinck. You, know, you look at Paul right now. Paul is usually very quiet, man. Now he's yelling. And he's going in. Yeah, he's going in for that. He's, he's, trying trying that in. he's having trouble Hunter, getting Hunter's one on fighting him. Hunter's Hunter's fighting, Hunter's fighting it. it. He's a game youngster, this Hunter. And he's, he knows what Paul's trying to do, and he right. doesn't want to let him get hit. Hunter made it. He broke it. And the club comes with him. They're going to split it out, there. they are. And hard, slugging hard they Ooh. are. Hunter's oh, got, oh, got, oh, got Joe's now. Take it, listen, and hey, to the nose. Hey, 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 drop. Hunter oh, takes him now, picks him up. Oh. Head down that back again. Pass the cross. You going to go for the pin, yes. You got him down for that pin. He's got the leg. Oh, oh most powerful Joe. Up for Diggs, going nuts. He takes ball now, whips him into the rope. Pass to the back oh. of Joe's caught him. Joe's experience paid off right there since that backdrop situation. He's going to go uh, okay. for a super. No, no, no. I think that's more of a brain buster. Drop right on the head. This could be it. We have a winner. As Paul Jones executed a brain buster there on young Tim Horner. And he's the winner. And Prepper Diggs in the ring now with Jones very proud. Here was the beginning of the end. Jones, since the backdrop situation, caught him with it kick coming off the ropes and set him right in here we'll see him now hoist him high in the air and then drops him right back on his head instead of a suplex situation a lateral press there gives paul number one jones a victory we'll be back with more action right after this so there you hear it a little bit more than a suplex situation going on there paul jones defeating tim horner we heard what his motivation was on Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. It is about titles. Now we will hear from Ivan Koloff, who just got done defeating Leroy Dargan. His motivation, still getting back at the Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant. 
all his fruit. And America, they give him the TV belt that belongs to Cora. Well, I don't care who I have to go to, whether it's Patterson, whether it's Backlund, whether it's uh, this uh, Jack Briscoe here, or this uh, Wahoo McDaniel. I don't care who it is. Steamboat, I don't care. It'll just be a matter of time. American, crazy American, boogie woogie man. Until I get my way, until I get you in my type of match. And then I will get my TV title back where it belongs to Kola and Upper Day. There we hear Ivan Koloff joined in progress. He will go through anybody. Doesn't even matter if they're not in the territory. He is going to go through anyone and everyone to get back his television championship from the boogie woogie man, Jimmy Valiant. And I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am right now. And, you know, one of the things that we like to do on the Mid Atlantic Championship podcast is whenever it's possible, make sure that programming that is relevant to what we're speaking about. Make sure that if it's around, that that we get it and we air it for you because you need to have context. And it is so great that the WWE Network has all these old Mid-Atlantic Championship wrestling shows up on there, but you need to have the worldwide shows as well, too. You can't have one without the other one because so much took place on both shows that affected the other. And most cases, especially back in the day, for weeks on end, we would see the highlights, but it's it's nothing like seeing it in its entirety, in, in, in its original form. And we're able to do that today because of these recordings from, from David Chappell and United States Champion Sergeant Slaughter. We heard what he did on Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, taking the feathers of Wahoo, tearing them up alongside the Marines, and he's challenging Wahoo McDaniel and you hear him, I, I sort of spoiled it a little bit earlier on with, with talking about how Slaughter wants to scalp Wahoo. Well, guess what? The genesis of that takes place here, and this is when you know Slaughter wants to challenge Wahoo, belt for hair. Ladies and gentlemen, coming in right now, the United States Heavyweight Champion, Sergeant Slaughter, and I see you've added something to your... That's your right. Point. Not only am I the U.S. Heavyweight Champion, but I am the new chief around here. Wahoo McDaniels, I heard him out here, and he had crocodile tears. He said, my feathers are gone. My feathers are gone. Well, you know, that means a lot to an Indian, but he would not admit it. And there's something else that means a lot to an Indian, and that's your scalp, Wahoo McDaniels. You know, when an Indian loses his hair, if he should lose his hair, he doesn't go to the promised land. He's not going to go to heaven. That's an old proverb that the Indians have over the years. And you know what, Wahoo McDaniels? If you want a shot at me, you're going to have to put something up because every time I wrestle you, I put up about 30 stitches. I put up a broken nose. I put up black eyes. I put it all up. And I put the U.S. belt up. Now it's your turn to put something up, Wahoo McDaniels. I'm sick and tired of you getting three shots at this U.S. belt. Well, let me tell you, Walter McDaniels, if you want another shot at me, you're going to have to put something on the line. You know, Custer, he lost his battle. They took his scalp. Walter McDaniels, I'm winning the battle here. Dust to dust. Feathers to feathers. All right, that's the United States Heavyweight Champion. I'll go ahead and cut it right there for now. Hair versus title is going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. Wahoo McDaniel and Sergeant Slaughter. Sir Oliver Humperdinck then steps in, joined by Bad Bad Leroy Brown and Ivan Koloff. And of course, they've got a little bit to say, not only about Jimmy Valiant, but Leroy Brown's feud with Ricky Steamboat, which had just started up. You know, Wahoo McDaniels, without his feathers, looks greater than a Safeway chicken. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I like it. Let me talk for a minute about the bad man from Chicago, Bad Leroy Brown. You know, Ricky Steamboat, Ricky Steamboat had to start something here that he couldn't finish. But we're going to be after Ricky Steamboat, and Steamboat, had to, just don't ever turn your back on the big man. Please, I want you to tell me a little bit about the Briscoe Brothers. Let me tell Boogie. you something about the Briscoe Brothers and Booker Wicked Man, the Briscoe's a half-man. He's talking. Look at him. The Briscoe's a half-man. Let me tell you something. 
David Crockett, you know people right here are panicking and everybody's going crazy. But let me tell you one thing, and you better put it in the bank. When it's all over, bad, bad will be number one. You better check it out, baby. That's on. exactly right. All you got to do is watch for the one that the mouth is moving. That's the one that's talking, okay? It's going to be cool off right now because he's got something to tell everybody about that Siberian Salt Miners Glove match. Take a look at this. I want the director to come in real nice and close on this fist and check out those studs and those brands and that glove. Jimmy Valiant, that's what's waiting for you. And any time we get a chance to get you into the ring in a Siberian Salt Miners Glove match, brother, we're going to be there. Listen, I have dreamt about it. I have been spending nothing but nights of cold sweat dreaming about getting this man in this situation, getting him in the Siberian Salt Miners match. This is where I got the advantage. This is where I can get the glove and beat him. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with more action right after this. So there you hear the Humbert Inc. crew banter about, and either right before this promo or right after this promo, we got Kelly Kaniski and Mike Rotundo defeating the NWA Mid-Atlantic Tag Team Champions, Private Nelson and Private Kernoodle by disqualification. We know that because we have the promo to close the show, but before we get that, we get another localized promo, and this time, it's time for the good guys to speak on what's going to be going down Friday, August 27th at the Richmond Coliseum. Now let me tell you about a super sensational card at the Richmond Coliseum on Friday, August 27th. Private Nelson and Private Canodal against Porkchop Cash and King Parson. Ninja takes on Jay Youngblood. A Russian chain match for the TV title. Ivan Koloff against Jimmy the Boogie Woogie Man Valiant. Speaking for Jimmy Valiant, here's Jake the Snake Robert. How long have you been running Koloff? A long time. That's why Jimmy's not to do this interview today. He's got tired of you running. He's brought it to a lie. He says you got to stand and fight, or he's just going to let you go, brother. And he's not going to let you go. You know that. He's going to get you into that ring. He's going to do what he's been wanting to do for a long time. That's kick your rear. You know, one thing you Russians don't understand, when you come over to somebody's backyard, you got to play their game. Well, it might be your kind of match, but it's going to be Jimmy Valiant's game, brother, and be ready. Also, you're going to see six-man tag team action. Gene Anderson, Paul Jones, and Bad Bad Leroy Brown with Sir Oliver Humperdinck as manager. Team to meet Jack Briscoe, Wahoo Daniel, and Roddy Piper. Jack? Well, we got quite a surprise here. Sir Oliver Humperdinck and his house is growing. Now it has Paul Jones and number one Paul Jones. Big deal. He thinks his thing is making money and winning titles. Well, he's gone for the same old promise that Leroy Brown's gone for money, diamonds, and gold. Well, Paul Jones, you've deserted your friends. Chief Wahoo McDaniels and myself have been your partner many times. Now to see you go over the house of Humperdinck. Well, we got a surprise for all of you. we got one of the toughest, rugged men in professional wrestling today as our partner. The surprise is Mr. Roddy Piper. And believe me, Humperdinck consulted Piper, and Piper is ready for this match. You know, Briscoe, McDaniel, Piper, what a combination. Jones, you know, you tried the other side of the fence once before, and we beat you so bad that you came back and joined us. Now the man sold his soul again for money. Now you're going to have to go out, and you're going to have to wonder if those guys are going to stand beside you and fight. Jones, you're liable to really get hurt. There you hear from Jake Roberts. On behalf of the Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant, talking about his upcoming match against Ivan Koloff in Richmond, Virginia, as well as Wahoo McDaniel and Jack Briscoe, Roddy Piper getting in there against the House of Humperdinck. You got to love Wahoo McDaniel there. Paul Jones turned on Ricky Steamboat in 1978. Wahoo reminds him, we beat you so bad you had to come limping back to the other side again and promising that again to take place in Richmond, Virginia. Big Bill Ward there on the microphone. Absolutely love those localized promos. And when they got back on the show, it was time for the main event. And the main event saw Ricky Steamboat, Jay Youngblood, and Jake Roberts defeat Jim Dalton, Ben Alexander, and Juan Reynosa. And we're going to go to the show closing promo, which features Steamboat and Roberts and Jack Briscoe saying that rumor about Roddy Piper wanting to join Jimmy and his brother Jerry is true. Jack. Well, the message going around that Roddy Piper wants 
Jimmy Zion, my brother Jerry, and myself to join him. Now, I don't know what's going on here with Piper. I know he's highly insulted by some of the things Humperdinck has said, and I know he's very upset with Rick Flair, the world champion, for what Rick Flair turned on him. So he's asked us to be his partner, join him in some endeavors. So we're going to, we thought it over and decided, yes, we'll join Roddy Piper, but we're going to keep our eyes on him because I'm not going to believe it until I see it. All right, and you definitely know what Roddy Piper's life is. Well, I'm all, I know exactly what he is, and I'll have my eyes on him at all times. All right. Timmer? You hear a lot of threats coming from the house of Humperdinck. It it's seems that, Leroy Brown. That's what I was going to say, David. It seems I'm going to have my hands full with a man that's about 6'5", 330 pounds. Well, you can get out here and say what you want, Leroy. I just took it upon myself to do what I had to do. Just bring yourself on. You want a piece of me that knows? I'll be around. Just call for me. Jake. You always got to do what you feel like's right. I'll tell you something, Flair. You've been doing a lot of things. i tell you, remember this. It only takes one knee lift to beat you. And I've showed a lot of people that. To be ready. That's true. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next week. Right here on Worldwide Wrestling. So there we are. Worldwide Wrestling comes to an end. Jake Roberts alludes to the fact that Ric Flair and he will be facing off coming up August 16th. Greenville, South Carolina. It's for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. He is going to get his shot, but my gosh. Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, Worldwide Wrestling, August 14th, 1982. Shows that are not available on the WWE Network. History that has been saved by David Chappell. The work that David and Dick Bourne put into the Mid-Atlantic Gateway website is just awe-inspiring for somebody like me. There would not be a Mid-Atlantic Championship podcast if it was not for those guys. Once again, we got a lot more to come. I also have your thoughts and musings on Starcade to talk about as well. I had recently put a question up on Twitter just to, to in, in spite some, uh, in spite, uh, inspire some conversation. I asked, what was your favorite Starcade? Not the one that you think was the best, but the one that gives you the most feelings. The one that when you hear Starcade, your mind immediately goes back to. And for me, that was 1985. And apparently for a lot of you, <laughs> that was 1985. But let me go ahead and get to these results from this week. We start off in Sumter, South Carolina on August 12th, Thursday night. Jimmy Valiant defeated Ivan Koloff in a New York street fight. Ricky Steamboat defeated the Ninja by DQ. Also on Thursday night in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, Municipal Stadium, Porkchop Cash and King Parsons defeated the Privates by DQ. Gene Anderson defeated Johnny Weaver. Jack Briscoe defeated Leroy Brown. And Wahoo McDaniel defeated Sergeant Slaughter. Friday night in Charleston at County Hall on the 13th. The Fabulous Mula defeated Peggy Lee. Wahoo McDaniel and Jack Briscoe defeated Sergeant Slaughter and Leroy Brown. And Jake Roberts defeated Matt Bourne. While in Wilmington, North Carolina on Friday night, Legion Stadium, Jimmy Valiant faced off against Ivan Koloff in a New York street fight. Paul Jones was scheduled to face Angelo Mosca. And the Privates were scheduled to face off against Pork Chop Cash and King Parsons. On Saturday in Collinsville, Virginia, Patrick Henry Community College, Johnny Weaver was set to face Matt Bourne, and Jimmy Valiant and Jack Briscoe were scheduled to face off against Ivan Koloff and Angelo Mosca. On Sunday in Asheville at the Civic Center on the 15th, Jimmy Valiant defeated Ivan Koloff in a New York street fight. Jack Briscoe and Paul Jones defeated Sergeant Slaughter and Leroy Brown by DQ. And in Roanoke at the Civic Center on Sunday, Ricky Steamboat defeated Matt Bourne. Private Nelson Private Canoodle defeated Jake Roberts and Jay Youngblood. Jack Briscoe defeated Sergeant Slaughter by DQ, and Jimmy Valiant defeated Ivan Koloff in a cage match. On Monday the 16th in Greenville, South Carolina, Jack Briscoe and Wahoo McDaniel defeated Roddy Piper and Sergeant Slaughter by DQ, and NWA World Heavyweight Champion Ric Flair defeated Jake Roberts. Also on Monday in Orangeburg, South Carolina at the Fairgrounds Racetrack, Ron Ritchie and Vivian St. John faced off against Ben Alexander and Leilani Kai while Johnny Weaver and Jay Youngbud faced Angelo Mosca and Gene Anderson. On Tuesday in Raleigh at the Civic Center, Ric Flair defeated Jimmy Valiant in an NWA World Heavyweight Championship defense. Ricky Steamboat defeated Leroy Brown by DQ, and Jay Youngbud defeated the Ninja by DQ. Also on Tuesday in Columbia, South Carolina at the Township Auditorium, Paul Jones defeated Abe Jacobs, and Wahoo McDaniel and Jerry Briscoe, alongside Jake Roberts, defeated Ivan Koloff, Roddy Piper, and Sergeant Slaughter by DQ. And that takes us back around to Wednesday, August 18th, 
Charlotte, North Carolina, the WPCQ Studios, Channel 36. And when we get back from break, your thoughts on which Starcade of the Crockett generation gives you all the feels. <laughs> 